Thank you for joining us today for this CAS webinar. I am uh, Kent Chesky and I serve as the Executive Vice President for the Council for Agricultural Science Technology, or CAST. Uh, we're very pleased to share with you our most recent CAS commentary, Stewardship Challenges for new, uh, new Pest Management Technologies in Agriculture. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the CAST website. As noted on the agenda, uh, we will have a question and answer session uh, of panel authors uh, following the main presentation. And at that time, we'll open up the chat box uh, for questions that you may have of our panelists. Next slide, please. CAST was formed in 1972 to provide balanced, credible science-based information about food and agriculture to policymakers, the media, private sector, and the public. CAST is a membership-based organization comprised of scientific and professional societies, nonprofit organizations, universities, companies, and many individuals. Next slide, please. <clears throat> It is through our network of members and member organizations that we select topics for CAS papers, as well as access a network of scientists, engineers, and other subject matters who help produce those papers. CAS has a small staff that's located in Ames, Iowa. Much of the work that CAS produces is through the volunteers who serve on our governing boards, our task forces that compile and write the papers, and reviewers that make sure our papers are unbiased and based upon sound science. Over the past 13 years, we've involved over 800 subject matter scientists who have graciously volunteered their time, energy, and expertise to help us with this work. Our publications and information are attended for audiences of policymakers, the media, private sector, public, and the public and the educators. We do this to increase the accessibility, awareness, and understanding of the science, technology, and innovation that is so critical to food and agriculture. If you visit our website, you will see several different types of CAST publications. Our most popular are our CAST issue papers and commentaries. We also produce an Ag Quick CAST for each of our papers that serves as an easy to access executive summary of key information. We have also recently introduced the student study guide, which we hope will be used by teachers and students to learn more about current food and agricultural science issues. Listed on our website are other CAST papers we will be releasing over the next several months and through the rest, rest of 2020. Through the use of social media as an important part of our science communication efforts, I invite you to join us on any of these platforms. Uh, just as a reminder, today's uh, program is being recorded. Toward the end of the presentation, we'll post a message that the chat box is open for you to submit questions to our panelists. Like all of our publications, this paper was compiled and written by a task force of volunteer scientists and other subject matter experts. The task force for this paper was chaired by Dr. David Shaw. Dr. Shaw is a provost and executive vice president of Mississippi State University, where he's responsible for academic policies, integrity of academic mission, the academic operations of the university. He first joined Mississippi State as an assistant professor in 1985 with a joint teaching and research appointment in the Department of Plant Pathology and Weed Science. While on the faculty, he was recognized as the William L. Giles Distinguished Professor, the university's highest distinction. David is a fellow of the Weed Science Society and a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Science. Dr. Shaw, thank you for your work on this paper, and we look forward to hearing from you and the highlights of the paper. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kent. And, uh... Thank you very much, Kent, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with uh, all of the folks that are listening today. And I'll have to say that here on campus at, at Mississippi State, it's great to be able to step away and actually talk about something that's not COVID related, uh, because that seems to be dominating conversation uh, these days, as it is, I'm sure, with everyone else. Also wanted to provide um, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, kudos to CAST, uh, having been a member since I think 1982, while I was in graduate school, I have long believed in the mission and vision of what CAST represents. And so when Kent and the team uh, at CAST asked if I would be interested in, in working uh, on this topic, 
I readily said yes, uh, in no small part because of the opportunity to work with my fellow uh, authors and the panelists that will be on today. Next slide, please. Publication was uh, was put together by a great team of folks, uh, Dave Irvin from Portland State University, George Frisbold from the University of Arizona, Ray Jassome from Michigan State University, and Greg Sword uh, from Texas A&M University. Next slide, please. So this, this cast commentary paper really had two goals. Uh, one was to identify and explore the stewardship challenges uh, to be able to understand management technologies and how uh, growers and technology developers need to understand those challenges. Uh, and then second was to address the role of different stakeholders in successful stewardship of these technologies. Next slide. I think a lot of us understand uh, that technology is, is not only a way of life, but the means by which agriculture has been so successful. They are key enablers for more efficient agriculture. And at the same time, any new technology, when it came along, brings both benefits and risks. Uh, and that, that does not just apply to those that have been ve developed recently. If we go all the way back to the development of the mobile plow, a number of huge advantages that came, but at the same time, a number of challenges in terms of soil erosion. Uh, the, another example that readily comes to mind would be the, uh, the development of, of uh, synthetic fertilizers and the opportunities that that created in enhancing yield and efficiency, but at the same time, the challenges that we've experienced from offsite movement. So as we think about stewardship, uh, this is often defined as careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. But we, we uh, as stakeholders, need to be thinking about how you break that definition down. And you, we usually think of it in three ways. What constitutes careful and responsible stewardship? Second, what are the contents of something entrusted? And finally, what parties are respo or hold responsibility for exercising this care? Next slide. So as we think about the goals, the overall goals of agricultural sustainability, we usually think about this in four ways. One, uh, production, that is satisfying human food, feed and fiber needs and contributing to biofuel needs. Second would be environmental sustainability, enhancing the environmental quality and the resource base. Third would be economics, the sustainable economic viability of agriculture. And then fourth is balance being able to find that balance in quality of life within the social groups that include farmers, farm workers, and society as a whole. Next slide. So as, we, as our paper put together the, the benefits uh, that the authors believe uh, came about because of new agricultural technologies, they fell into a number of, of categories. Uh, these could include simplified pest management, uh, being able to enhance the efficiency and economics, being able to see less toxic pesticide usage, being able to enhance food quality and reduce food contamination, being able to enhance yield and receive reduced demand for land use, being able to reduce the overall pesticide use, and finally being able to enhance soil conservation and environmental quality. Next slide. But with all of these, we also recognize that uh, there are a number of risks that are associated. And the next, this slide and the next one came uh, actually directly from a table that, that is in our commentary paper. And what we've done is listed a number of the risks, uh, real and perceived, and then the legal and regulatory measures that can be used to mitigate uh, these risks, and also a column for the stewardship or voluntary measures that can be used. I'll just touch on a couple of these as examples. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking a lot more about resistance um, in the rest of this presentation, but uh, for example, the legal and regulatory measures that have been taken would be uh, things like refuge management, uh, actually labeling uh, on the pesticide label, on the product label, the mode of action, uh, resistance management plan requirements for pesticide registrants, 
whereas the voluntary measures would be adoption of integrated pest management practice. Next slide. Another example on this would be gene flow. Uh, this, this could, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, include field trial regulations, uh, planning restrictions, or seed certification. We also have a number of voluntary measures that can be incorporated on this as well, which would include buffer strips, uh, field isolation, differential planning or harvest and crop rotation. Next slide. So as we think about the risks associated with any new technology that's been developed, and specifically for genetically modified or GM crops, there are three federal agencies that have primary uh, responsibility uh, to be able to um, understand and manage these risks. The first that we have listed here is the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And this falls into two categories in, in terms of regulating field tests and planning of genetically modified crops. And secondly, regulating field trials and planning restrictions with these genetically modified crops. The Food and Drug Administration has responsibility for regulating GM crops for food and animal feed safety. And then finally, the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA has uh, responsibility to regulate GM crops that produce pesticide proteins, and they also are responsible for regulating pesticides that are used in conjunction with genetically modified crops. Next slide. So as we think about all of those who have responsibility for stewardship, this is not simply the growers. Uh, you can see a long list here. These are the farmers and their managers. Obviously, we think about those quickly, but it's the pest control technology manufacturers. It's the independent pest consultants. It's agricultural retailers, government agencies, university research and extension, non-governmental organizations that are involved in IPM, in food and in natural resource management. It's the consumers, it's property owners, it's agricultural lenders. And as you can see, the list can go on. I'm sure each of you can probably think of additional stakeholders that should be listed in this, please. So I'd like to talk for a few moments about some work that I and several of the panel members have been doing on pest resistance and uh, identifying this as a, a wicked problem. You can see the publication that's referenced there, but a wicked problem is one that has no simple cause or solution. It refers to a class of social system problems which are often ill-formed or where the information is confusing. And finally, where there are many clients and decision makers with conflicting values. And on this last one, as you can imagine, we just simply would need to reference back to the previous slide or the list of stakeholders to be able to understand all of the, the folks that could be involved in both the decision-making proce uh, process and also in the implementation. Next slide. So as we think about the evolution of resistance, and as a weed scientist, we have often talked about this being a problem that is biology related, or we have often talked about it in terms of being a technology problem, because as we have developed new technologies, we see the emergence of resistance to that technology. However, I think all of us uh, that are on the panel today fully recognize that it is not just a biology or a technology problem, it's actually a human problem. Because my decisions in using the technology is what has driven the evolution of resistance. And therefore, as you can see the quote from two of the panel members uh, today, the reliance on, um, sole reliance on education about technical assistance simply is not going to be able to stem the advancement of resistance. It is going to take the things that we'll be talking about today in terms of stewardship if we're going to be able to uh, turn the needle. Next slide. So what I'd like to do for just a few moments would be to give you some examples of some things that a, a team from the uh, Herbicide Resistance Education Committee with the uh, Weed Science Society of America has conducted to be able to do listening sessions in seven regions around the country back three years ago. And from those listening sessions, which were composed of growers, um, regulators, uh, industry, uh, crop advisors, as well as uh, scientists from universities, 
the listening sessions really uh, resulted in about seven themes that emerged. And this publication is, is cited uh, at the end of the commentary paper, uh, if you'd like to look at this in more detail. But really the first theme that emerged uh, from uh, that, the listening sessions was, there's a desperate need for new modes of action or mechanisms of action. And this really drives to, there's always going to be a silver bullet uh, that the expectation that uh, just because I have resistance today from overuse or use of a new technology doesn't mean that I'll always have that because something new will come along. Next slide. The second thing that emerged is there's no more need for regulation. And the flip side of that was the conversation about can the threat of regulation actually motivate changes in behavior uh, from individuals and from community. Regulations were very much perceived as a barrier. Um, the Northeastern listening session was the only region of the seven that indicated that regulation might actually be a part of the solution. However, and as I noted on the last bullet here, the concern for Palmer Amaranth that was just exploding at the time that we um, conducted these listening sessions certainly was changing the perceptions about the possible need for regulatory action. Next slide. The third theme that we saw was there is a need for more education, but that education was for someone else, for others. Uh, the, the, uh, the idea that came forward there is I know what I need to do, but everybody else needs to know what they need to do and they're not doing. Uh, I think the, the clear message that came out was that there's much more need for communication and collaboration between all of the stakeholders that participated in our listening session. There needed to be consistent messaging uh, across the stakeholders and to be able to better understand um, other mechanisms beyond just the herbicides that were being used at the time as a part of an overall management system. Next slide. This theme, uh, number four, is, is probably the one that, that was the most striking, and that is diversity is hard. We often, as weed scientists, talk about the need for diversity, diversity of modes of action, diversity of, of weed control mechanisms, both chemical and non-chemical. But what the growers clearly expressed uh, concern about was that, that with the, the size of their operation, with the lack of labor available, uh, with a lot of reasons that were given, diversity is a very difficult means of, of implementing uh, resistance management and, and stewardship of technologies. There was also a, a, a great deal of point uh, that, that this is one of many decisions that I have to be making and one of many actions that I have to be making. And therefore, with the, the blizzard of uh, advice, and the blizzard of expectations, it's very difficult to really focus on this one, uh, one action or one set of actions that needs to be taken to be able to effectively manage and steward uh, these technologies. Next slide. The fifth theme was the current agricultural economy makes it very difficult to do things di uh, differently. Um, everything from affordable financing and low commodity prices all the way to regulatory requirements for compliance with conservation programs were all offered up as a significant barrier to stewardship. There was a, a, a great deal of cry uh, for incentives and incentives uh, came in a lot of different forms, but there certainly was a recognition of the need for diversification but the economics that, that are uh, challenging to be able to do that was one of the real key themes that came forward. Next slide. Number six, we are aware of resistance, but we're managing it and we're not in a panic. And what we typically found was that unless there was a crisis situation, there was not sufficient motivation to be able to actually address the stewardship needs. As you can see here, there were a number of folks that were concerned that responded to our surveys and the listening session, but there was also concern uh, that, that there was simply not enough going on. But finally, the, the last point that I would make is the concern that did seem to raise a great deal of question in the participants' mind was the possibility of multiple resistance. 
And I'll be touching on that later in one of the examples that, we're, that we, we are closely um, working with and monitoring uh, in Pacific Northwest. Next slide. So what did we learn uh, from these listening sessions? It really fell into about uh, five major categories. One from a community-based approach to resistance management and from a community-based approach uh, from the standpoint of stewardship. One, diversity is a strength, it is not a weakness. Second was the social dynamics are considerably more important than the biological facts. There was a great deal of importance uh, that was emphasized on shared values. There was also a lot of conversations and this pointed directly to the, the university uh, researchers and educators in the room. And that was we need to stop persuading, we need to stop convincing and educating, and we need to start listening and asking and sharing. And this resulted in the conversation about a changed language that we use in the conversations, not here's what you need to do, but what can we do together? And then the next one was people tend to support decisions that they believe that they have been a part of in the construction of those decisions. And finally, most stakeholder groups share a number of values and that alignment was highly probable when they really understood those shared values. Next slide. So in our uh, commentary paper, uh, we found, we uh, really highlighted two examples of success. Uh, next slide. The first one is a great success story that happened, especially out in the Western states on the coddling moth. This is a very aggressive pest in home fruits. It was uh, in hit, uh, d demonstrating uh, substantial resistance to a number of classes of insecticides. And what resulted was a cooperative effort between growers, researchers, extension specialists, industry, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. One of the key findings uh, from the research was that mating disruption could be a key element in management strategies. The cooperative effort that was developed really was constructed to be able to create a continuous feedback loop on the successes and the failures. There was continual adjustments based on the successes and the experiences of the failures. The grower involvement and the buy-in in, in the study uh, in this project was, was at every step of the way. Uh, this was actually also a great example of a project that very much was self-regulating. It was very strongly supported by the federal and the state uh, agencies, but it was very much driven by the growers themselves. And in the end, insecticide reductions occurred in as much as 80%, and those, those insecticides that were used were much more effective than they had previously been. Next slide. Second example that I wanted to share with you was the pink bollworm. Uh, this project was uh, based on a long history of work that had been done with this in cotton. This uh, bollworm, pink bollworm was first detected in the United States in 1917. And by 1965 was one of the major economic pests of cotton. It was widespread uh, in its distribution and eradication efforts had been uh, fairly futile up to that point in time. However, the project that began in the late 60s really focused on four main strategies all working together. And that was first, mating disruption using pheromones. It was secondly, sterile insect releases. Third was the cultural control. And finally, BT cotton when it did come along. Next slide. Now, probably most important on this slide is uh, it, rather than trying to read the words, would be actually looking at the timeline itself. The early collective action began in Safford Valley Cotton Grower Cooperative in 1969. And as you can see, in, in 2018 was when the pink bollworm was, uh, eradication was declared. So if you think about the, the, the length of time that we're talking about, it's probably one of the most important take-home messages from this entire presentation. There are, there are no quick fixes. It's one of those that requires a great deal of conversation, a great deal of, of effort, a great deal of knowledge and knowledge sharing amongst a very wide group of individuals and stakeholder groups to be able to be successful in this. Next slide. 
So what did we learn from these two examples of successes? Well, first, it requires a diverse chemical and non-chemical set of practices if you hope to be successful. No one practice will be the silver bullet. No one practice alone can be successful in being able to uh, address the stewardship issues that we discussed. Second was collective action was required. No individual could take these set of actions and expect to be able to be successful. It required a community, very much required the village that we often talk about. The third example, that, and this is the one that I was just talking about, is incrementalism is, incrementalism is essential. In other words, don't expect us to get there in one year, in 10 years even sometimes. It required a great deal of patience and a great deal of long-term vision to be able to understand that. And that really touches on the last point as well. The long-term commitment was an absolute requirement if we were going to be successful in the collective action of the group. Next slide. So two more examples that I wanted to share with you that are very much in stages of development. Next slide. The first is one that is uh, the Iowa Pest Resistance Management Program. And this really fundamentally has been working for the last few years. And you can see a number of the groups that are working together to make this happen. The major tenets of this program are that number one, it's voluntary, it's not mandatory. Number two, it's consistent, coordinated efforts across all of the ag sector. So this is state and federal agencies, this is grower groups, this is the university that's there in Iowa, it is the Farm Bureau, it is the, um, the growers associations and the growers themselves, it's industry. Uh, so it's across the board. Uh, it's very much community-based. Uh, it's very much focused on one of the points that I made in the, in the last slide, and that is adaptive management. The ability to really learn from what is going on this year and adapt for next year to be able to make adjustments. And then finally, the focus is the pres preservation of the viability of pest management technologies and farm profitability for the long term, which really harkens back to the definition of stewardship that I gave you at the beginning of this presentation. Next slide. The second example that I wanted to share with you is one that's very much in the beginning stages of formation, and this is the Pacific Northwest Herbicide Resistance Management Program. Uh, as you can see, going across this field was what we often call a tumbleweed, a kosher plant that was seeding um, herbicide resistant seeds as it tumbled across the landscape. What they're experiencing now is, is that this species has resistance to every effective class of chemistry that is used in the cereal grain production there in the Northwest. At the same time, they simply cannot talk about going back to tillage as a primary tool because of the high vulnerability to soil erosion for many of these soils. You have a very low annual rainfall. You have very few ro uh, uh, options for crop rotations. And so the growers are now organizing themselves collectively to be able to address this issue. They are very in the very early stages of development, but as I, as I spoke about in one of the listening sessions, uh, slides that I gave a few moments ago, there's an extreme sense of urgency because they fully recognize that they are in the, in the beginning stages of what can be a full-blown crisis. They are working with their state agencies, they're working with uh, grower groups, with extension and research, uh, and with, a number, with industry and with a number of other partners to be able to develop a program that would be self-funded to be able to begin to address uh, this and develop best management practices to be able to work together to address this major problem. Next slide. So as I move towards the conclusion, the uh, recommendations that are listed in uh, the commentary paper that we have with CAST would be first, to engage inclusive stakeholder groups to inform the stewardship programs as they continue to be developed. Second would be to develop improved research capacity that really identifies the incentives, the risks, the constraints that influence effective stewardship of pest management technologies. Third would be to build human management skills associated with pest technology stewardship. 
Third, uh, the fourth would be to promote voluntary community-based stewardship for pest management technologies. And finally, to reform public and private policies that work effectively against stewardship. Next slide. So, as I list the conclusions from our paper, number one would be solutions must be developed within local communities, first and foremost. Second would be cooperation must be broad, it must involve all of those that are listed here, all of those that were listed on our stakeholder list from an earlier slide, and others that you may be thinking about. Third was techno optimism is a huge challenge. If I believe that a silver bullet is just around the corner and that if EPA will just allow the development of that, then I do not feel the urgency to be able to develop the community-based approaches that are gonna be so critical for effective stewardship of these technologies. And finally, as I said earlier, diversity is hard. Being able to think about effective stewardship in the context of all of the other decisions that a grower that retailers, that crop consultants, that industry, that universities are having to make is extraordinarily difficult. And it really requires a collective action if we hope to be successful in effective stewardship. Next slide. So as I wrap up this, I just remind you of the quote that's often attributed to Albert Einstein. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the very definition of insanity. And so with that, I'll certainly turn it back over to Kent and open it up for any questions. Dr. Shaw, thank you very much for that great uh, overview of the highlights and the key information uh, about this paper. We are receiving several questions that we'll begin to address with our panel of subject matter experts in just a minute. But as we prepare for that, let me share some information about some upcoming uh, publication releases that we have coming up. In June, we're going to be releasing a new cast issue paper on agriculture and the microbiome. This will be presented by the co-chairs, Dr. Ignacio Carbone and Megan Andrews of North Carolina State University. And then following that, in July, we have another paper that will be released on the impact of human health and safety of naturally occurring and supplemental hormones in, in food animals. And again, that's a cast issue paper that will be uh, shared by Dr. Ray Robert Collier with the uh, University of Arizona. We'll, uh, in September, we have a, another paper that we're very excited about is the importance of communicating empirically based science information for society. And that presentation will be shared by Dr. Stuart Smith, associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan. We're looking really forward to those programs and sharing that information. We do not have exact dates on those, but please stay tuned. As I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we're very pleased to be joined today by a number of the other uh, subject matter experts and people who worked with Dr. Shaw on this uh, paper. And at this time, please welcome Dave Irvin with Portland State University, Ray Jusami of Michigan State University, George Fiswall with the University of Arizona, and Greg Sword with Texas A&M. Uh, thank you, panelists, for being with us today. And now I'm going to turn the program back over to Dr. Shah to kind of lead the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Kent. So the first question that I want to actually pose to each one of the panel members in turn, and I'll ask Dave Irvin uh, to begin, but from your perspective, what is the single biggest challenge in stewarding new agricultural uh, technologies? Thank you, David. Um, I, I narrowing this down to one challenge is hard because we we wrote about all the big challenges in this paper but I think probably the biggest one for me is how we're going to really pull off this process of, of building an inclusive stakeholder process the the dynamics of that are very difficult as our examples show in codling moth and and pink bollworm it takes time uh, how we can, uh, if you will, incubate those processes and clone them or spread them across the country where we're having pest management issues is really going to be a challenge. And it's going to take, we're so schooled in trying to come up with technical solutions to most of these problems, but this is going to take really deep and hard, rigorous social science to pull this off. And we have lots of experts around, but most of the people working on pest management are not trained in this area. So to me, the challenge is how we're going to train the next generation of people 
to, uh, to build stewardship uh, management regimes that are more effective using social science and working with all the stakeholders. And, and we know from good natural science that diversity breeds resilience. And that's what this is all about. We need a diverse social process and we need a diverse technological and biological process as well to pull this off. And so I think the challenge is how we're gonna find ways to bring these various groups together and be effective in their various communities and, and bring all of the knowledge together, not just the farmers, although the farmers are primary, of course, and the, produce, and the uh, suppliers, but all of those people who have a stake in the outcome of long-term effective pest management stewardship. All right, thank you, Dave. Ray, your song? Sure, thank you, uh, David and David. I'll, I'll just, you know, support and echo what Dave Irvin said, but add to that the challenge that, <clears throat> you know, we can't think of a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. You know, and I think as your examples pointed out, David, you know, we talk about even just herbicide resistance. We're talking about, well, depending on a region, we're talking about um, different types of weeds that are becoming resistant to different types of chemicals, let's say. Uh, and we're also talking about different types of production systems, say corn or soybean or wheat or what have you. So uh, one of the challenges to remember, we, we're gonna to have to have a diverse approach to all of this that certainly follows the principles that Dave Irvin talked about, but we need to recognize that there just like there's no one single chemical technology that can solve the problem, there's no one single social technology or approach that can solve the problem either. All right, thank you, Ray. Greg Sword? Yeah, I don't, um, again, I don't, it's a very complex problem and I don't have um, uh, a brand new solution to add and, and the points raised by uh, the other folks so far are, are spot on. What I'd like to emphasize is, um, you know, is just a reminder that humans are notoriously bad at learning from our past mistakes. And so the problem that we're talking about today, stewardship, is not a new problem. In fact, it's a very old problem. Um, insects, weeds, pests in general have been evolving resistance to, I think, literally every strategy we've thrown at them um, to try to impede resistance, you know, from, from the very beginning. So, it is going to take new ways, new approaches to dealing with an obviously very complex problem. And um, I, I strongly believe in the conclusions of this paper that the human element, um, wrapping our brains around how to get people with different interests and different um, levels of expertise and knowledge about local problems working together um, collectively towards the same goal, um, is a, a huge problem, but that's really the only way it's going to work. Thank you, Greg. George, first of all? Well, I think um, people have to realize that there isn't going to be any single one patented product or invention that's going to solve all their problems. I think actually in the report we said there's no silver bullets, but you want a number of arrows in your quiver. So private industry is going to develop new and useful technologies but to use a dreaded sports analogy, it's like if you come up with a new innovative football play, oh, that might work really well for a couple of games, but eventually other teams are going to figure it out. And if you use the same play over and over again, they're going to figure it out faster. So I think when um, new things come out from the private sector, I think a still the message that this is only one part of a much larger uh, strategy uh, that you have to have um, needs to still be emphasized. All right. Thank you, George, and thank you, thanks to all of you. Uh, we've had one question posed. Will this slide deck be shared? And yes, it will. Uh, and then the next question uh, that I guess I'd, I'd like to maybe direct to a couple of our panelists, um, Dave Irvin and, and Ray Jason, is there one group from the list of stakeholders that is the most disruptive to the adoption of new technologies or practices? I, I don't, 
I wouldn't phrase it that way. I certainly don't think so. Um, I, you know, there may be different groups see different problems and different groups have different um, interests they have to, needs they have to deal with. Uh, but I, I'm, I guess I'm loath to suggest that, that one group um, is more problematic. And indeed, I think the, one of the, the, the approaches is to make sure when you bring together stakeholder groups, you, you get into a listening mode rather than a, a um, identification mode. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, let me add to that. Uh, that's a it's a very good question because you know we've all been to meetings where there are some parties and groups that are disruptive, and we don't like that. But when you when you really look at the social research, you find that often when you give people a voice in these processes, that we these in stakeholder processes, they, they we we find that there are ways that they're much more likely to be cooperative than we think. We often label people ahead of time with maybe stereotypes of whether well, they're going to be just interested in this or just interested in that. But the, the process, and we've probably all been involved in focus groups and other things, the process of sharing values and understanding perspectives from these diverse stakeholders often brings much more commonality than we think at the beginning. So I would, I'm like Ray, I agree with Ray. I think I wouldn't want to label somebody as disruptive from the get-go. Let's get them in a room together, give them voice and listen to them. Listen, listen, listen to their perspectives to understand why they're coming and why they're articulating the positions they are. Thanks to both of you. This next question is really a statement, but I'm gonna ask uh, Greg Sword, if you would, to, to be the first to respond to this. It's a little bit long. The problem with these timelines is the change in specifications for our pest management products. In the 70s and 80s, society asked the pesticide industry to move away from organophosphates and carbamates to chemistries with lower risk to mammals and especially humans. The industry responded with neonicotinoids that provided a higher level of safety for mammals and humans. The shift to the newer products has taken decades and now society is asking for materials that will not impact pollinators. So the innovation and shifts have to happen faster so that we're not reacting to societal shifts. Greg, thoughts on that? Um, yeah, the, so the, the timeline point is interesting. Um, I've seen some, some folks that have tracked the introduction of new technologies relative to the timeline at which pests evolve resistance to them. And it's actually really short. Sometimes it's just a couple years. So the fact that, that some of these technologies have lasted for, uh, you know, 10 years, 20 years, um, it does speak to, the, to some of the positive attributes of, of, of stewardship being followed and properly implemented. Um, the, the societal um, request for changes in attributes of pest management is really an important part. So, you know, at, at its core, we want a pesticide to, to remove a pest from the system. And there's lots of different ways to go about that. Um, we started out with, with really toxic compounds, most of which were derived from, from chemical weapon nerve agents, um, had broad toxicity. And over time, we have managed to really refine the the toolbox to, um, in some cases, compounds that are, are uh, very specific. Um, looking forward, we have opportunities with biotechnology to potentially, you know, develop control technologies that are possibly even species specific. Um, but at this point, we are up again um, against a timeline issue. So, for instance, the regulatory process to get um, some of these newer, um, let's say, RNAi um, crops out that are species specific um, is pretty long and burdensome. So we have society calling for changes in, in pest management tools. Uh, but again, the, the regulatory scenario might not allow us to implement some of the things that would be possible at a timeline that people would like to see. Uh, thank you, Greg. 
This next question I'd like to uh, direct to Ray Jassom as well, uh, because Ray was, was uh, very heavily involved in a number of the listening sessions that we conducted. To what extent did area-wide programs mapping past locations and population levels and modeling of effective responses come up in your discussions with stakeholders? Um, well, I think it was variable, but I, I don't think it was a dominant theme of the discussions. Um, and I think in part because um, one of the things we, we heard over and over again at the listening sessions was a recognition that the problem existed. And I think uh, there was more interest and, and more hope for new solutions to address the problem. And, um, you know, yes, yeah, certainly I think some of us believe that we, we need more information on, you know, how, how exactly these problems are evolving. But I think the general theme of a lot of the listening sessions tended to be more directed towards we need the tools to address the problem because we know it's there. And there was certainly not a lack of recognition of the problem. Thank you, Ray. David, uh, this is Dave Irvin. I might suggest you, you ask George Frisvold about this question mm -hmm. as he's involved in an area-wide program. Um, the, um, it, it usually ar arose out of crisis. Uh, the, the example from pink bollworm um, and coddling moth was that there was this initial attempt to just do it on an individual basis, farmer by farmer, um, out of in a very small uh, scale, and that basically failed. And you saw the shift toward an area-wide approach when it was pretty apparent that a more isolated farm by farm approach wasn't working. Um, and even my experience in Arizona, there's there's been you know pink bollworm eradication. There's been like white fly control that was done on a more area wide basis, and a lot of growers are still feisty about the requirements under the area wide program, even though it was highly successful and really saved their economic bacon. So uh, area wide uh, approaches take a long, long time to develop you know, as, as that timeline showed, uh, that, that growers are resistant to doing it um, and they'll, they kind of only do it when nothing else works. Thank you, George. George, I'm gonna follow up with you on the next question as well. What are the best practices and ideas to address techno-optimism and create a sense of urgency to protect technologies before effectiveness is already critically threatened? Oh, that's a good question. It's a tough <laughs> question. The note for those not familiar, the idea of techno optimism is there, the belief that there's going to be a silver bullet. There's going to be some backstop technology that's going to bail uh, growers out. Um, and there's a reason growers have that. You know, a lot of growers have been farming for a long time and they've seen different kinds of chemistries come and go. And industry always has come up with uh, something new. Um, but, you know, it's a good research question. It's something I'm working on now is what makes people techno optimists. And we've seen that people are much less likely to be willing to cooperate. They're much less likely to adopt diverse practices if they really think the silver bullet is coming. And so kind of a next phase of research is what makes people techno optimists. And they think part of it is that uh, farmers are still getting mixed messages about uh, what works and what they need to do. Um, and you could see uh, things coming out from various CEOs saying things like resistance will be eliminated in 50 years. Well, that's evolutionary biology. It's not going to be eliminated, you know, by 2050. So um, I think people are still getting these silver bullet messages and, and people information shop. They're being, when they're, when they're told, oh, this is going to be hard, this is going to be a hard, and then they're told, oh, here's a product that's gonna come and fix all your problems. People like to hear that message. 
Um, so I think more work needs to be done um, to, to see how people respond to messages. I think farmers are getting a deluge. I think you said like a, it was like a snow flurry or a blizzard of information. And so, but I think what happens is that overly optimistic information tends to crowd out, um, you know, the more measured information. All right, thank you, George. So this next one I'd, I'd like to go back and do as we did to begin with and pose it to all four of our panelists. It seems the findings are largely very pessimistic. Are there any tangible reasons for optimism? So, so David, I'll start. This is Dave Urban. Uh, I think there are reasons for optimism. Um, there's a large body of, of uh, science, very good science, uh, that uh, documents how these local community-based solutions can work. But as George and Ray and others that Greg have, have talked about, it's going to take time. And so when we have this, and often it's a common pool problem, that is everybody's in it together and, and their actions affect every, their neighbors and so on and so forth. Uh, it's very important, it's ab absolutely necessary to bring people together to work on it as a group, collaboratively. And that's gonna take time, but it has been done. And in fact, uh, Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for talking about how this can be done in various cases around the world. And we know it's been done. George has given us the examples of, uh, of the pink bollworm down in Arizona and the coddling moth in the Northwest. It can be done. It's not easy. And we're not training people to do it that way. And that's one of the biggest problems I have is we're not doing the necessary research and education to give people the skill sets to come together to do this. So it's very much, it's feasible. And I'm optimistic that we'll figure a way out of this uh, but we have to find ways to incent people and bring them a lot of the soft technologies of how to collaborate with one another. I'll stop there. All right. Thanks, Dave. Greg, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've obviously talked at length about the challenges to implementing good stewardship, but I, I do believe there's lots of reasons to be um, optimistic. The first is simply just the examples that were shown today that are already out there of, of collectively addressing and working together to address problems. And then I do think we can marry it with, with a little bit of techno optimism. Um, I'm, I'm a little less familiar with what might be on the horizon for, for weed, weed problems. But on the insect side, I do think there are some, some new tools that are coming around um, that, that could be beneficial. But of course, their success, not just in the short term, but in the long term, requires stewardship. And, and we need to marry the good new technologies that are coming out with, with uh, these types of practices that we're talking about to preserve them for, for future use or, or expand their longevity in the market. Thanks, Greg. Ray? Yeah, I, I think I, I want to have a little fun here and challenge the question a little bit. You know, a, a popular metaphor for that kind of question is, is the glass half empty or the glass half full? And of course, a, perhaps the most accurate answer is both. It's half. And <clears throat> I think one of the things we're trying to do with the report, we're not, we're not trying to be either optimistic or pessimistic. We're trying to actually get away from that and say, you know, like a lot of problems we're faced with in the world, it's a challenging issue. And if we try to think of it only, oh, let's be pessimistic or let's be optimistic, or we're trying to be pessimistic or optimistic, then I think we're undermining an understanding of, you know, things that are wicked problems. And we're undermining the notion of what good stewardship is. And of course, as part of that, as, as Gregory has suggested, there are there are new tools come al coming along that can be incorporated and used. So yeah, you can be, in that sense, optimistic. And I, but I think the, the ultimate optimism comes from a willingness to work hard and, and see this as a complex problem. And I don't view that as either being optimistic or uh, pessimistic. Maybe I view it as just being realistic. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ray. George? Um, 
if I think if people had said like in Arizona that cotton production would you know cotton would be a low insecticide using crop I think a lot of people would have been very shocked so I think um, the, the two examples from the report I find incredibly encouraging because if, there's both huge economic benefits and huge environmental benefits coupled um, that doesn't mean it's easy and again I think the, the idea of ease has been oversold it's like farmers you know have to move from being you know passive purchasers of products to be you know engaged in in you know something that's more community based but that's the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that the results aren't impressive and i notice there's a little comment up from tim dennehy about the role of regulation um and the, the report itself talks about cases where, you know, you have regulation and you have cases where there's voluntary, you know, stewardship programs. And again, I don't think those are either or. Uh, Kathy Seegerson, environmental economist at University of Connecticut, has done a lot of pioneering work about when voluntary approaches work and when regulatory approaches are needed. And one of the lessons from that literature is that a lot of times having regulations in place or having the threat of further regulation is necessary to actually stimulate uh, creative, you know, institutional uh, innovations and voluntary measures. Thanks to all of you. I, we have two or three questions that I, I, I put together and I'm going to throw it out to, to all four members again. I know we're about to run out of time, but really how do we incentivize folks to make proactive changes to avoid the development of resistance before it is already a large financial problem. So this is focused on the incentivization side of it. George, let me go to you first. Um, well, I mean, there's going out of business is an incentive. I think sometimes people use incentivize as, uh, as a kind of a euphemism for government payments. And of course, you know, there are things where federal programs like crop insurance programs or equip could probably be modified uh in different ways to encourage better adoption but um the the solution isn't always going to be you know come from federal agencies uh paying folks that that there's the pressure of staying in business is is an incentive too all right right uh hmm well, I think I would emphasize something that Dave Irvin said earlier, and that is listening to people. I think uh, a real incentive is when people feel that they're, they're now becoming part of the answer. And that that applies to the, all the different stakeholder groups. And so, yeah, you have to incorporate people into the process. So I think that's an important, because once people feel like they're actually can be part of the process, they'll, they'll do something. And I'll add a note about regulation. You know, we tend to think of regulation, uh, as George mentioned, something that, that's involved payments, but we also tend to think of regulation as top down. It's very easy to think of regulation as bottom up in, if you use a different approach. And, and I'll, let, I'll just use that as a way to let Dave Irvin speak more about bottom up regulation in other words people coming together to develop rules for themselves that can regulate behavior all right so dave take that one away okay well thanks ray give me the tough one here um i you know i want to say that i think the incentives we've got to make it easier for people to come together and that that's going to take creative new creative social institutions uh because i agree with ray i think once you give people a voice you find that they're actually they enjoy being involved in these processes and solving these wicked problems and i think that's what george found on in the, in the cotton bowl worm down in arizona the people they may grouse a lot about it but they want to solve the problems and often if we can find ways to bring their knowledge and their commitment into it uh, that's that's going to make it much more sustainable and and resilient in the long term. So, we've got to find ways to make it easier for people to become engaged. That means lowering the cost. Whatever they may be, those may be 
financial costs, those may be personal costs, they may be embarrassed Fair about person. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dave. Greg, take us home. I don't, I'm not too sure I've got much to add that hasn't been covered on that one. All right, thank you. Well, uh, to, to all of the, the folks that have listened or will pick up the recording later on, I hope you can see from the discussion that we've had, this is an outstanding group of scientists to work with. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to be able to put this report together. And I, again, will express appreciation to CAST for allowing us to do it and to, uh, to really uh, bring the vision to, to creating the, the idea for the document itself. And so with that, Kent, I'll turn it back over to you. Dr. Shaw, I'd like to say thank you to you and the team of folks that put this together for a great paper and a great discussion. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us. I would again remind you of our upcoming releases that we've got over the next couple months. Uh, we will be uh, sending information out via email and other forms to, to let you know when these are scheduled. So please join us for any of those. And again, thank you to all of you who've joined us today for this presentation. Uh, as was noted, uh, this is being recorded and will be available on our website, so we will post it and please uh, direct others to, because I think it's a great discussion about the importance of stewardship and a lot of the, the, the complexity of this issue. I do also want to acknowledge and thank our friends at Dairy Management, Inc. for their assistance in providing today's webinar. Thank you all and have a great day.